before I begin, if you were one of the lucky 31 people to watch the original video, you would have noticed that it was very... broken? Well, you can thank Femora for that. Just do not get their product. I could make a video on why, probably, but as you can see, images were blurred, keyframes weren't working, my stills were blacking out everything out, and yeah, here's another one. The titles became basically ghosts. I had to go back to Filmora 12 since I needed to pay for Filmora 13, even with a perpetual plan. Anyways, on with the video. Hello Spirit, so we're finally nearing the end of this god awful show. I hope at least, because if this gets to 10 seasons, I swear to god. Now while I will never say this show is good or that anything past season 1 is possible, because before I spoil anything, weirdly enough, season 7 actually feels like a show that's set in the future of How to Train Your Dragon. Because take it from someone who has a lot of experience watching this show. They did so much by repeating so much from the past stuff and using it to tell a story already obvious. Who's Tom and Thunder's descendants? Gee, I wonder who. What does the weird quest mean? And instead of using that past stuff to tell an original story, they don't do it and never do it. Three of them and you just went like full alpha. Kill me. They make duplicates of your favourite dragon, storylines that stretch for too long, have mirrored characters, and so much more. The fact that they just straight out copy the scene pisses me off. But believe it or not, I am surprised this time around they did something original that utilises old elements to tell something new. So without further ado, Dragons of Nine Round Season 7, finally original. If you've got headphones in, you will most likely hear dogs barking. I didn't realise this until I had finished recording all this and started editing. <sighs> Something last video I dedicated a segment to was that teens can often suffer from a parent leaving or their marriage splits off and none of it in animation media ever explores something like that. Previously on Experimental. Serious topics that centre around a majority of kids and teens today. Parents leave, split off, and it sucks they don't do something with it because instead of constant hate, they could be praised if they had competent writers. And to add on to that, there is a lot more than just that. As a range of teenagers can go through depression, anxiety, Tourette's, abuse, and so much more. Or in cases like this, child neglect, a lack of a father in their life, growing up antisocial and connected to technology, and yet they do next to nothing about any of it. Oh, I mean, they may focus an episode on it, but it's so poorly done half the time. As in a lot of media, these kinds of things can be present, but most of it is never further explored or developed. Actually, they cut in again. I forgot to mention a show that actually included a serious topic relating to this. Abusive mothers. In the Owl House, Adelia had a lot of control over Amity and even her husband. This included forcing her to get rid of her best friend, dye her hair, and assumingly help her sell the merchandise they provide. But as time passed with Lou, she broke away from her mother's grasp on her and began to grow as a character. She gained new and old friends, cut off ties to toxic ones, and further masking Adalia as the villain. Like for example, D'Angelo brought up Tom's dad once in like season 2, maybe 3. And what do you know, they don't bring him up at all. And the only time where a parent dying in recent animation, and it focuses on both the parent and the kid, was in the Owl House with Luz's dad. There's even a few background appearances of Winston's dad in Bluey, where he's divorced and in the show tries to date again. And even Via and Stolas in Hell of Boss, and how Stolas' actions affected him and his daughter. Now while the season or show in general doesn't touch upon any marriage issues, surprisingly they further focus on an actual thing teens go through and they do it with the kid. Well, they do something like this with D'Angelo. My second least favourite character out of the entire team next to Eugene. In the show, the relationship between each of the characters and their parents is really scarce. Tom and Olivia have a few episodes early on when she was important. Alex and her parents have only had one, maybe two. They literally don't know what to do with May. Which, by the way, can I mention they still have not made an attempt at fixing the strained relationship between June and May again. She's not even in this season. Again. Recently on fire. Was season four, William. Then there's D'Angelo. Well, he's never had the screen time to compensate his relationship with his father. He's had small moments with D'Angelo, but none of it was dedicated to an entire episode. 
or as of late. In the episode, DeAngelo's father disapproves of his son's career choice of being a veterinarian doctor, as he has wanted him to be a first lieutenant to stay on guard beside him, rather than being cooped up in a hospital helping dragons, and thinking his passion was only a phase that would ultimately lead into his footsteps of being a ranger, as he views it as something that's not as important as setting up centers or patrolling. So he plans to restrict dragons for being on the surface and putting an end to the hospital and overall stop his career choice of wanting to be a veterinarian altogether. Edict. Banning dragons in Rake Town and shuttering your little hospital. No, Dad, you, you can't! I can and I did. These dragons are a nuisance, D'Angelo, and they only serve as a distraction from the real threat. Only through the episode, D'Angelo tells his father he doesn't want that to happen, and his friends are the choice his father was making. And halfway through, his father warms up to the idea by actually having screen time in the episode, which he bonds with a hobgobbler, who I've, who have only realised have become bad omens to pets. And by the end, he sees the worth of his career choice, why dragons aren't a distraction, and to truly support his son's passion. The episode is basically a way of saying how a family member doesn't respect a career choice and thinks it doesn't reach their full potential, or doesn't have any worth. Which, for once, I will applaud the fucking writers because they finally show an actual problem a lot of kids and teenagers grow up in households under parental guidance, while also using it where dragons are involved, but it's also focused on two real career paths that someone who's watching may follow or relate to. Essentially, kids shouldn't follow in their parents' footsteps. Instead, they should focus on what brings them joy, what they're truly passionate about, not what makes them unhappy and distant. <laughs> oh, while in comparison to another theme they did back in season 2, which was Alex and her anxiety, which she was afraid to perform in group presentations, which I can relate to because I've had to and will have to do more oral presentations. Only, instead of making it less dragon related, they make it so Alex has to overcome her fears by going through zombie feather wings to save her dragon, and a titan wing. But the best part is that, they don't even show if the growth even affected her, or helped her speak in an oral setting. They brush it off and never return to the concept, only that she's become more sassy and quick-witted to her friends. And it's also not a surprise, do they bother including any powers or gadgets they use in that episode. However... That's it. While it feels like the writers have finally written something better in comparison to their poorly executed anxiety episode, it does not qualify them as pristine writers in any episodes that had or may come after, as you'll see soon enough. As it took them seven seasons to do something teens across the globe were affected by, and when they did something like that, it's taken them longer with something seven seasons in the making. Seven seasons. It took seven fucking seasons for Tom and June to start dating. Throughout the show, we've been reminded a few times that these two are destined to be together. They're the hiccup and astronaut of our time. So how can they not be together, am I right? Season one established the relationship, season five teased the relationship, and season six teased the stronger feelings for the relationship. But it should not have taken this long for the main characters who are obviously going to be together to, you know, actually get together. When you're writing a character and another character to be together, Please make sure you do it right. In cases like Miraculous, it was their choice to conflate the story so much that it affected the relationship between the characters. Because the movie is proof of that. For context, the characters have time to bond as both Merritt and Adrian and their counterparts. The love square is there, but is very brief and felt deserved to be there. And yes, I will take that opinion to the grave. Or Hell of a Boss where it's written to be stretched out because one is emotionally broken and one has never felt love. And they learn to grow from each other and others. But in this show, it is quite literally a simple teen love story, only with dragons. Not something that needs to be revealed, never spoken of for like 3-4 seasons, teased, and finally executed after 7 seasons. They start dating after episode 2, where through the episode, where Tom is pressed by the others about his love for June, but he basically insults her by calling her weird when he said it would be weird for him to be in a relationship with a childhood friend. Which hurts her feelings and they have to work out their problems to fix it. Oh, you took that the bad way, didn't you? Which the future of their friendship becomes reliant on the dragons. Since, like most animals, they're emotional, and with the help of the wood chippers, I've just noticed how these newer dragons are more or less based on animals. You do realise it was cooler when you could tell it was a dragon, and they acted like an animal, not look entirely like them. But through the episode, they work through it since dragons are emotional creatures. Well, the wood chippers specifically in this instance. They're just woodchucks, basically, as said by these two. 
And he also thought the Omen stuff about breaking up was about them, and that's for later. And an example for a love story is in Lucifer. Spoilers ahead. Did you just get to the timestamp already? Through the show, Lucifer and Decker have feelings for each other, but Lucifer is ignorant with his feelings. And when either has the courage to speak up, others in their life take action. When he's revealed to be the devil to Decker, she runs away, further straining their friendship and what their relationship would be. But also showing she still loves him because she tries to still work with him, even when she's scared and processing all of it. But she finds it hard to cope that supernatural beings exist like how others who have discovered this fact react. And she eventually accepts it all and only fears that he may go away to hell again. Their characters who are both growing, Lucifer struggles to be good and wants to change and Decker wants to accept them for who he is. They're slowly changing to become better people. So yeah, when you're writing a love story, for the love of God, don't stretch it out unless there's a good reason for it. Lucifer isn't a simple character in, in his show, so the love story has a reason to be expanded and explored. Miraculous added too much and it muddled most things up. If you're doing a passion project or planning to, Look at this show and other shows that do this badly and do the opposite of what they did. Trust me, because the love interests in other shows have been done better. You can web me up anytime, Petey. I wear my sunglasses. Hey look, they took my advice for making a concurrent theme for a season so the characters grow as characters. Nah, I'm just kidding. Only because these episodes are made in advance, which is why they're so frequent and look so rushed. Now, something I brought up last video was the show should focus on a theme for each season. Previously on Experimental, because a theme in a season needs to be concurrent for a character to grow, not to be the same and only have an episode or two every season. Like in season six, Tom was a bad leader for two, maybe three episodes, which isn't really enough to grow a character, let alone have them have a character arc. But in this season, I'm glad they've decided to have an overarching character arc for the entire team of writers. Also, for the Tom part, most of the episode where he was a bad leader, it wasn't focused on how it affects the team. Despite how much I hate the show, I am glad they decided to at least have an arc that affects a majority of the episode. Where in season 6, the bad leader thing was a few episodes that were separate from each other. Rather than season 7, where the episodes show the impact of their isolation as a team. That's saying they could have had a better reason than all the characters going from cooperating, fighting a new dragon, to talking over each other selfishly in the next episode. And while I'm not saying that can't happen, the previous episode had everyone stacking on each other to get out, showing teamwork with no sign of straying for their own opinions and whatnot. The theme of the season basically shows how each are coping. Tom and June are together, so they're going on dates. D'Angelo is healing dragons. Eugene doesn't want to admit he wants the team, even when forming a new team, with Alex tagging along, until she tries to be by herself to play with her AI friend in chess, with other members popping up and bugging her until she's ultimately captured. And by the end, they work out their issues when stopping Buzzsaw with an upcoming creature, which is in the dark realm that has its own dragon sight that makes negative thoughts leak out more. Sort of like a truth serum. Even when in the episode before, Alex got the book back from Limit by making him think they were friends. Which is another theme they introduced five seasons after his debut. No later, and no sooner. Friend! Friend? Friend? I trusted you! Confided in you! <laughs> However, I'm not done, since I would say this counts towards the segment. While they made an arc for the characters, they somehow also retconned an entire theme. As what felt weird jumping into Season 7 was that, Season 6 introduced the idea of trust between the parents and the kids. In the episode where Eugene and D'Angelo get stuck in a loading bay after being entrusted that the dragons wouldn't be brought to the surface, and when they borrow the diving bell, and it's a stretch to connect it with the episodes where they have to out Slinkin as the bad guy, as it's reliant on the kids and the trust their parents have in them considering their status. But in episode 7 where they sneak around a diving bell they lose, and they wanted to own up to their parents, could trust them, and tell them about Leonard. But, of course we all know that he attacks the town, only instead of having some battle where they kicked him back into the hidden world, or have a few episodes where he rules over Rake Town to be the King of Dragons, since if he got rid of Rake Town, he would get rid of the entire team, since where are they going to live? Who are they going to tell? The government? They would have two seasons ago. However, they don't do any of that, and remember that trust stuff? Apparently a few weeks later is when season 7 is set in, and their parents are just... Fine with it all? Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Len is back in the ice realm. Sledkin and Linda are out and about. In fact, 
gone, gone, gone. Ah, <sighs> alone at last. And Tom and June's mother are nowhere to be seen, and were only mentioned for exposition. Alex's apparently aren't affected, and the only time where trust may have been a factor for one of the actions was the entire reason why DeAndre's dad is more focused on protecting the town. Since he brings out Landon multiple times, but they would never actually say it, so... Buzzsaw. The hatchet wheeling lunatic with a giant dragon who attacked the town a few weeks back. Buzzsaw. Buzzsaw. So, yeah, for the life of me, I cannot figure out why they retconned an entire theme they were setting up, other than that they're incompetent writers or they're different each season. That could have been used for even an episode since they did it before, but I don't know. They could have given the parents actual screen time because I'm willing to bet 50% of them are more interesting than the main cast. And that's not saying much. When I was editing this, I had a little time to reflect on one of their characters that has even less screen time than any of the parents combined, D'Angelo's mother. To keep it brief, the reason I had said I'd forgotten about her in one of the other videos was because she's barely a character in the show. Let's see, she's supportive to her son, a teacher of... So Sorts. D Wait, do they even do learning in the show anymore? Disabled? Oh, nothing else? Shocker. And that trust between kids and their parents is a key part of love. If you lose that trust, then how can you trust parents with anything? And how can they trust you? Actions speak louder than words, and it seems like words fix those issues. Come on, I'm her son. Of course she trusts me. Okay, it took a lot of convincing. And she probably trusts Thunder more than she trusts me. Even when destroying a diving bell and lying about three dragon taming humans roaming the realms. And if they had done it right, this could have been another great thing to tell the kids who like this show instead of just outright getting rid of it. Who are you gonna call? There's a couple of new dragons, and as you can tell, I am really excited about them. The newest dragon looks so stupid. It's called a glass caster and looks like a goblin fucked a dragon. This was written before the end of the episode where they base it from a troll that can smell glass. Its abilities are alright, but it's just a dragon that can shoot out hotter flames and echolocation. Nothing really special to it. They also bring back another dragon that has not evolved, aka the Typhoomerang, where they're apparently doing some dance that endangers Rake Town. But on that, since that dragon is not afraid of eels, they finally did something original with the Nine Realms, by adding on from the previous property, rather than doing the same thing again. Which is the main reason behind the title, giving a reason as to why eels are a dragon's weakness, or at least why they're afraid of them. Since it was really only speculation as to why, poisons, chemicals, stuff like that, but at least they're trying something new by introducing the World Serpent, whose mythological name I will not even attempt. He is locked away behind a cage at is specifically built for anyone who possesses a nightlight, or rather the retractable teeth of one, which was constructed by Hiccup who has finally returned back to the story, or so it seems. How do you know for sure Hiccup did it? Who else could it have been, Eugene? I don't know. One of my awesome distant relatives? Release it, it fucking eats the sky torture with the most graphic audio. I I'm actually surprised this kid show allowed this. <laughs> The other key part is that this is an actual Norse mythological creature, and surprisingly an old dragon they've ripped off or taken. But that's all we can see during the finale, with it going to Rake Town, as it finally feels like the ending of the show is coming closer, and I'm hoping by next season, because it feels like it's edging towards that considering the ending. Right, I remember, they don't kill dragons in this show. I bet the Sky Torture is alive, and then I bet the snake's going to escape and go into the realms. Come on, guys, before the Sky Torture comes back! Flashback. Most likely not, because a few of my other theories haven't come true, but the show doesn't kill dragons, so. While the giant dragon eating snake, two more rounds to explore, and. Sorry, I mean one realm. They said two rounds in a previous episode, meaning there's only one realm left, and that actually limits it down, so I think this might be the last season. I'm hoping. Please. And the dreary end credits music. 
Though I'm not sure, as I feel like they're somehow going to stretch the story even further with other things they've left unexplored. And the world serpent going towards Breaktown, the characters breaking up and getting back together, the remaining two rounds left, so they may actually do something with that, but they also need to explain what dragons are in the giant realm, because the mystery of how big those dragons are is better than the other stuff. Did you notice any unusual creatures after today's quake? Just you! Why are you so big? I'm from the eighth planet in the Kreplok system where... I mean... I'm from Samoa. Well, all right. Oh, well, now we know. As well as June and May's relationship, if Hiccup is actually the one leaving artifacts, and if Eugene and June will become siblings again. And with the new dragons all listed out, let's mention the old dragons that for some reason in episode 3 turn into the biggest group of pussies in How to Train Your Dragon history. In one episode, they surround the Timberjack dragon, and in the next, they're carrying like children against the Glasscaster, which is a singular fire breather and echolocation dragon. Which for starters, they have faced tons of dragons varying in size and powers, and for some reason, instead of just going through with the dragon alpha stuff from last season, they decide, hey, let's just have fun to collect the dragons and that will make them not be pussies. Which worked. See what I meant by they introduce something but don't go through with it until a season or two has passed? This. This is what I meant. Actually, I have more to say, and I forgot to add on to it, so... Another part of why I said they should have done the alpha stuff was because the episode revolves around Thunder keeping the dragons together, and how none of them listen to him. So Tom asks him to keep them together while they are captured. But again, why would they cower like this? I'd say it's because they're domesticated, but in the episode, they also say he's a wild animal. So, it's never explicitly said or even implied enough where an, even an adult can infer what's happening. Because when I look at them running away despite all the seasons I've watched, I think worse dragons since Rescue Riders. If they're going to introduce a plot point that the franchise has already done, they may as well just go through with it. It hasn't stopped them before, and it doesn't now. And still, I can't believe they finally acknowledge Norse mythology after seven seasons. Which is why the show is called The Nine Realms, because of Norse mythology. Did you know it took the seven seasons? However, I may be reading it wrong here, but didn't they call the realms realms before they established it had anything to do with the Nine Realms? Seeing Norse mythology mixed in feels really lazy looking back. They don't really delve into the Nine Realms or Norse mythology or the Norse mythological aspect at all with lore or dragons. Like, it's bad enough they were using lazy ripoffs of the originals, but I don't know why they didn't just make it about the show's theme. Imagine if they used Norse mythology as a source for designing newer dragons. Imagine a Nine Realm version of the current roster. They would have felt so much more original. So I'm only realising that what I said may sound a little odd with this part. When I mean they're finally using Norse mythology, or should use it to design the characters, while the films and series used Norse mythology, it was really just for the idea of dragons and vikings, and some mentions of mythology such as Thor, and I think even Odin a couple times. But the series supposedly shows a more understanding of the concept, but they do so little with it. As in the Nine Realms, there is such a thing as the Nine Realms. I'm not sure if the structure Dune says it's real or not, because I don't know how to begin spelling that. It's Fartle fame from Norse mythology. But the trolls are real. Let's talk about the animation, and what a surprise, seven seasons later, the animation hasn't even improved. At some point there were some really good expressions, which reminded me of the time where Transformers Prime would sometimes give the characters really expressive movements, and so they decided to give some weirdly well expressions for one of its worst design characters. <laughs> What's his name? Mm. Hobbs. I'm gonna build him a perch on top of the big dome so he can be our lookout dragon. <laughs> God, he looks worse naked. They also have Thunder, a chance to dance to cause a distraction with music that doesn't match up with that fair budget they have for each season. And there was the credits which was funnier than the jokes. Wait, wait. Does the show do jokes anymore? Oh yeah, they had that one voice recording thing in episode 3. I originally didn't like, but was unexpected and actually funny for once. Are you crazy? Wait, I'm just gonna record this so I can play it back on Perpetual Loop. <clears throat> Are you crazy? 
Are you crazy? Got a new for actually making me laugh for once to this show, Nine Realm Riders. Oh, and they forgot to add the laughing for episode 6. But essentially the main drive for this segment was that for each season there's concept art I've touched upon in the past which shows better stylized characters and dragons. They were so lazy they weren't bothered adding new images of concept art to their fucking credits. And there is no way there wasn't concept art because there's a giant snake, a dragon troll, the group of enemies teaming up and more. And yet there wasn't enough concept art for the credits? What the fuck is wrong with his eyes in this scene? None of your vegan beeswax, missy. Uh, boss, I don't think beeswax is vegan. Of course it is. Insects don't count as animals. The point is, I'm not saying anything to a no good dragon writer. <laughs> To end this off quickly, in Season 6, Leonard finally got the Dragon Book from Tom, which in Season 7 allowed him to create crossbows and catapults, and found the World Snake. And even after losing the book, due to the team up between Slaken and Leonard, she has a photo of his contents. But why does he bother using crossbows and old fashioned weapons? Why not just bring actual guns and shoot the dragons down? I can understand the poison darts, that's actually something useful, but come on, if small darts can pierce a dragon's skin, I'm willing to bet metal bullets can as well. I swear I'll try my best. For once, I will admit that Dragons of Nine Realms, for once, feels like it's something original while also incorporating old elements to make something new, which is what a spin-off show should do. Take Fiona and Cake, they're a spin-off and yet they use the original Adventure Time elements and lore, but that doesn't mean the Nine Realms is redeemed. The show only used Norse mythology to name areas of interest, and they never used Norse mythology to make new dragons or change older dragons, besides the glass caster. Because through the show, they only plainly used older stuff to retell the same story. Who's leaving all the objects? What's the connection between Vine and Tom, but now they've used Hiccup and told something we haven't heard of, something he's done or made yet. Again, like I said, don't watch the show. His shows I'd better recommend, Spirit Out. Spirit out.